Cześć, Marek. Cześć. I'm, re I'm just ready. I'm just ready. Yeah? Okay. 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 So, so we can we can start. You. Know? Yeah. Greeting to everyone with us. On behalf of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, I would like to warmly welcome you to the first lecture of the GP2 lectures this academic year. The series is organized by the John Paul II Institute of Culture, which is part of a faculty of philosophy here at Angelicum. This lecture, as well as the entire GP2 lecture series, could not have taken place without the support of our university authorities, whom I would like to thank. Special thanks are also owed to the founders of St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, donors and supporters of the Institute, our audience and all viewers in front of the screens. The St. John Paul II Institute of Culture was established to look at the challenges facing the modern world at the church in light of the life and thought of St. John Paul II. The idea of thinking with John Paul II has been embodied in the GP2 lectures series, which are monthly lectures of prominent interdisciplinary scholars who revise the extraordinary contribution of John Paul II for our own day. Now, I'm pleased to give the floor to Dariusz Karłowicz, the initiator of the GP2 lecture series and the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture program director. Dariusz Karłowicz, we share more about our today's special guest. Hello, good afternoon. Dear friends, it's my honor to introduce to you Father Jarosław Kupczak. Polish Dominican and theologian, one of the world's leading experts uh, in the Christian anthropology of John Paul II. He's a lecturer here at Angelicum as well as at the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow, where he heads the Department of uh, Theological Anthropology at the Faculty of Theology. He also taught at Istituto Giovanni Paolo in Rome, the Pontifical Lateran University, and the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family in Melbourne, Australia. He is uh, the author of The Stein for Freedom, the Human Person in the Philosophy of Karol Wojtyla slash John Paul II, and the second book, Gift and Communion, John Paul Second's Theology of the Body, among other books. In his lecture, titled The Church and Culture After the Second Vatican Council, Professor Kupczak will explore the church's teaching on the relationship between the church and culture, bearing in mind the crucial role of the Second Vatican Council in forming the relationship. Drawing on the thoughts of the Pope of the 19th and 20th century, the Council formed a new relationship between the Church and culture. This relationship was based on the conviction that the Church would henceforth always live in a pluralistic world. An understanding of the cultures in which the church lives is necessary to proclaim the gospel. Father Kupczak will draw us closer to the thoughts of these key issues of the popes leading the church in the past few decades. Professor Kupczak, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you uh, for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, dear friends, um, uh, first I would like to thank the organizers of this lecture series 
serious for this prestigious invitation. So my gratitude uh, goes to Dariusz Karłowicz, the president of St. Nicholas Foundation, and Joanna Paciorek, the vice president, uh, to the uh, rector magnificus of the university, Thomas Joseph uh, White. Um, I would rather have you, Thomas, sit in my place and give you lecture on the subject, but since I was paid for it, I have to deliver, <laughs> uh, which I hope I, uh, I will. Um, I am grateful to Father Cesare Binkiewicz, the director of John Paul II Institute for Culture here at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas University. Marta Broniewska always keeps me close to earth with kindness, necessary information, and all kinds of help. I am very uh, grateful and honored uh, by your presence uh, here. Uh, I have already mentioned um, the rector of the university, uh, Professor Helen Alford. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, presence here. Uh, we have distinguished uh, professors of this university, uh, Paweł Czopek, uh, Antony Akinwale, thank you, uh, students, um, benefactors for your help. I am very grateful, the students here uh, are present in the group. I am grateful to the Dominican brothers uh, for their presence. I was asked to speak about the relationship of church and culture in the recent teaching of the church. While accepting this invitation, I insisted on referring this teaching to the Second Vatican Council in which shadow or light we still live. Therefore, I gave to this, to this lecture the title From Christian Civilization to Truly Human Culture, Church and Culture of the Vatican II. In this title, there is the main thesis of this lecture. It is about the change of language and change of attitude of the church toward the culture in the last um, 50 or so years. After the Council of Trent in the 16th century, the next ecumenical council was needed much earlier than the first Vatican Council 300 years later. The post-Reformation religious wars together with the rise of the new science prepared a way for modernity. The age of reason began, of clearing. Le siècle de lumière, the enlightenment, secolo di luce, oświecenie. One of the characteristics of the new culture would consist in the sidelining of religion, especially Christianity, from the public arena, since it was held responsible for the immense slaughter and loss of human lives in the post-Reformation wars. Christianity was judged to be unable to provide its promise the principle for a peaceful order in Europe and the world, the new science presumed to be objective and not ideological, based on experiment and mathematics, was expected to create the principles of the eternal peace in Europe. It is at the end of the 19th century, the century of revolutions, nationalistic ideology, romantic re reaction to enlightenment, that the Catholic Church finally tried to respond to modernity. The first Vatican Council convenes in uh, 1869 and ends abruptly after nine months where Risorgimento troops entered Rome from north. The Pope declares himself to be the prisoner of the Vatican. The unfinished first Vatican Council becomes the last one held in the Papal States. Between the First and the Second World War, there was a gap of 90 years, but culturally much more. The two world wars with their unprecedented slaughter of millions of human lives, the rise of the totalitarian regimes, Nazism and Communism, the atrocity of Holocaust and Gulag, mark the end of modernity, presumed to be the age of reason and start a new epoch filled with suspicion toward metaphysics and grand narratives of truth. People 
at the middle of the 20th century shocked with the depravity of war crimes, were at the same time looking brightly into the future with the establishment of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, immense economic and technological progress, decolonization in Africa and Asia. It is that at that time that the Second Vatican Council convenes. The Second Vatican Council had uh, finally the historic opportunity to respond uh, to modernity exactly at the moment when modernity ends, the new postmodern culture was already in the air. Jean-Paul Sartre and Martin Heidegger, Eugène Ionesco, Samuel Beckett, Albert Einstein and Werner Heisenberg. After 400 years since the Council of Trent worked under the umbrella of Ancien Regime, the church responds to modernity, but in the exact moment when modernity ends, it is already the postmodern era. It was Adolf von Harnack, the Lutheran historian of theology who called Syllabus Errorum of Pope Pius IX, published in 1864, um, 100 years before I was born, but more importantly, just before the beginning of the First Vatican Council, uh, Harnack called this document the Catholic rejection of modernity. Certainly, some of the formulations of this document dealing with an openly anti-Christian and particularly anti-Catholic hostile to revealed religion atmosphere of 19th century may have provoked this judgment. As we read in syllabus, the Roman pontiff would never come to terms with progress, liberalism, and modern civilization. Joseph Ratzinger, in his article written a couple years after the Second Vatican Council, writes that Vatican II may be interpreted as anti-syllabus, an attempt to reconcile the church with modernity. This concilia reconciliation was to happen in three areas that became the conflict zones during the last centuries the relationship of faith and science, the relationship betwe between church and the modern state, and the relationship between Christian faith and other world religions. In every one of these four areas, the achievements of Vatican II were immense. Today, we don't have time to talk about that. We are concerned with a more foundational issue, crucial for the conciliar discussions, however appearing usually more in the background than discuss expressive verbis, the relationship of the church to culture. In every place and time in the world, Christians have always created culture as evidence by, by countless books, architectural monuments and works of art. It's very easy to see it here in Rome. However, it was only in the modern period, especially in the 19th century, that the problem of relationship between the church, faith, and culture was clearly posed. The main reason for this consisted in the modern secularization process, which in the homeland of Christianity, Europe, created a culture independent of the church and often defined by its distance from the faith, often hostility. Even in the 19th century, the church could still look at the process of culture becoming independent from the church through the prism of the parable of the prodigal son who will soon return home. The Second Vatican Council is a sign of the church understanding and acceptance that it will increasingly address people who find their identity outside of Christian context within a culture devoid of any explicit reference to Christianity or even, or even to any transcendence, a culture that defined itself within, to use Charles Taylor's phrase, imminent frames. 
In order to illustrate the achievements of the Council in regard to the relationship of faith and culture, I will now turn to the two popes of the Council, John XXIII and Paul VI. John XXIII, as we know, was expected to be a pope of a short pontificate, but he became a pope of a breakthrough thanks to convening of the Second Vatican Council and the clear direction he gave for its work. A characteristic feature of John XXIII was a positive view of the history of his time. Today, we may accuse him, perhaps, of being naive and lacking realism, as some commentators do. In his homily delivered at the opening of the council, he criticized the prophet of, prophets of misfortune, who in modern times see only apostasy and decline, and encouraged a positive view of history, he said. In the present order of things, good providence leads us to a new system of relations between people, which, thanks to human effort, but beyond human expectations, aim to implement higher and unforeseen providential plans, plans of that providence that harnesses everything, even human differences, into greater good of the church. This positive view of the post-Second World, post World War human history was grounded in the fact that John XXIII had seen the history through the lens of faith as carrying within itself the dynamism of the providence. However, this somehow positive view of the human, human history poses only as preparatio evangelica not as kingdom of God, for the church. For the church to answer to human questions with eternal truth of the gospel. It was John XXIII who introduced to Catholic theology the notion signs of times, signa temporum, so important during Vatican II. In various events of human history as the Council Fathers stated, we can hear the voice of God speaking to his church, vox temporis, vox dei. Human history and the transformation of human culture are not alien or indifferent to God's salvific plans, economy of salvation. Therefore, the church cannot ignore or disregard them, which does not mean uncritically accept. The Constitution Gaudium et Space invites them, the people of God, informed in faith, who are led by the Spirit of the Lord who fills the earth, to recognize in the events, needs, and desires in which the Church shares with the rest of people of our time true signs of God's presence or purposes. The Church is called to recognize in the events of human history signs of God's presence or intentions. Signa presentia ver consili dei. Only the church is able to evaluate these signs because it re she refers them to their divine source, ad fontem sum divinum. After the death of John XXIII, it was Paul VI whose task was to navigate the concilia debates. His first encyclical, Ecclesiam Suam of 1964, uh, 100 years after Syllabus Errorum, was an expression of Paul VI's participation in the Council deliberations. We find there, among others, a call to dialogue with the world and its culture, he, he wrote. The church should enter into dialogue with the society in which it lives. Before we lead the world to faith, we need to get closer to the world and enter in conversation with it. By calling for dialogue with culture, Paul VI expressed the church awareness of a certain autonomy and independence or, of modern culture, or rather, different cultures. The popes, during the teaching of Paul VI, a significant change uh, occurred. The Pope of the 19th and first half of the 20th century consistently used the term Christian civilization. 
which is true civilization, which is built on the Christian principles, despite emphasizing that the church always intended to build this civilization not through coercion, but conversion of human heart. This concept draw attention primarily to the fact that the legal, political, and social system should be based on Catholic principles, certainly in suggest in the background the privileged position of the Catholic Church and her teaching. Exactly to avoid the suspicion that the Church still dreams about the cultural restoration of Ancien Regime, Paul VI recalled in his encyclical old expression from half a century ago, for, used by Benedict XV, his predecessor, the civilization of love. It was this term, instead of the term Christian civilization, that became the key concept in Paul VI's reflection on the world. It was used also by the future popes. Christian civilization in the teaching of the church becomes the civilization of love. In John Paul II, as we know, and as I put in the title of this presentation, it will become truly human culture. Paul VI was aware that the Second Vatican Council should join the modern quarrel about the human person, in which secular humanism became a weapon against Christianity. He said today, before the end of Vatican II, you, contemporary humanists, who reject the transcendence of the higher, highest things, know how to recognize our new humanism. We also more than ever have reverence for man. Secular humanism has appeared in its terrible form and in a certain sense opposes the council. The religion of God made man has met the religion, if there is such a thing, of man made God. What happened? Collision, fight, anathemas, it, could have, it could, could have happened, but it did not. The old story of the Samaritan turned out to be a model for the spirituality of the council, the end of quotation. Ecclesiology of the Samaritan, as we know, this is one of the favor uh, parables. Um, of Pope Francis, who frequently refers to this model of Samaritan in his teaching on the church. The reconstruction of Vatican II theology of culture would be a vast and ambitious project, primarily theological. We don't have the space, we don't have the time here even to outline its content. However, let me point only just passing uh, to two among many pillars of such structure. First, uh, this, would, this would refer to a historical understanding of divine revelation. As we know, the quarrel between history and dogma was one of the main historical disputes of the 18th and the 19th century. In a sense, uh, in the Vatican II teaching, we have a very sophisticated uh, reconciliation between those two terms where, where Christian revelation is portrayed as historical in nature, but historical does not mean relativistic. A very important role is played in this picture by culture, culture becoming part of the revelation culture becoming really a tool for, for the incarnation of God uh, with all the necessary uh, uh, warnings uh, we can say that if the word logos became flesh the word logos became culture in a certain, in a certain way. 
And the second inspiration for our longer uh, discussion on the relationship between church and culture would be found in the soteriology of the council, in Christology. If Christ, Um, good afternoon, Professor Weigel. Pleasure, pleasure to see you. I am very grateful that despite many, many of you um, uh, uh, works with the, with the Synod, you, you're with us. Welcome. If Christ is the only mediator between uh, God and man, uh, all man, all, all men, as the Council says, in the world belong or are related to the Catholic unity of the people of God. So every human person that lives in the world or ever has lived in the world or will live in the world, whatever the religion, is somehow related to the church. Well, we can see the immense um, conclusions for our understanding of culture that come from this uh, statement. As the council says, many elements of sanctification and truth are found outside of the church visible structure. We will return to this, um, to this point. The greatest achievement of the Second Vatican Council in regard to relation of faith and culture consists in its anthropological approach to culture, which can be found, of course, in the pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes. At the center of this approach is man, and of course, we will see how John Paul II account of culture is simply interpretation of Vatican II, creative interpretation. At the center of this approach is man, as the one who creates culture, needs culture, who creates himself thanks to culture. As emphasized by a Polish lay participant in the council, Professor Stefan Stierzawski, culture in the pastoral constitution Gaudium et Spes is seen primarily not as a sum of produced and consumed cultural goods, products. But that culture is essentially and fundamentally the full development of human personality. It is therefore, the council there then speaks about the culture of the human person itself, that is, the proper improvement of the human intellect and will, the proper ability to know and to act. The post pastoral constitution then reminds us of the importance of the classical idea of paideia, Greek pedagogia, as the essence of human culture. Every person is called to develop his or her personality and the fullness of being as a human being, the fullness of humanity can be achieved only through culture. In such an anthropological approach to culture, the key question then refers to the conditions and values that make then a person is, more is. The question about culture becomes anthropological question about man, which must also concern morality, that is, the way to realizing one's own nature, specific only for the person. Only person creates culture, and therefore culture is ethical in its nature. It fulfills the person or demoralizes the person. Ethical ecology of culture will become one of the main topics that Karol Wojtyła, John Paul II, will address. When we talk about ecology of culture, we can talk about tox toxic character of culture, referring also to our natural environment. We know what a toxic elements can be, dangerous for the human person. But then, why don't we address the toxic elements of uh, culture in general. 
the sources of the church uh, competence in the field of culture and anthropology are primarily theological because the answers to anthropological questions are found in Christology. Therefore, at the end of the chapter devoted to man, we find in the text Gaudium et Spes a moving famous presentation of Christology, which begins with probably the most frequently quoted sentence from the conciliar documents. The mystery of man is truly explained only in the mystery of the incarnate world. This conciliar lecture on Christology is based on the theology of St. Paul, in which Christ is shown as the new Adam, who, restored to, who restores to man the likeness of God distorted by original sin. Therefore, the council can say that Christ, the new Adam, in the very revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to himself and shows him his highest calling. Now, if we take seriously the Christological element of the uh, documents of Vatican uh, II, certainly it um, keeps us from very shallow and superficial optimistic reading of, this, of the documents of Vatican II. There is much more uh, 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 in the teaching of Vatican II than certain uh, criticism uh, um, that I pointed out um, from those documents takes. Now I, I would like to uh, 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 say a couple words uh, about the uh, conciliar understanding of culture in the interpretation of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Christocentric anthropology of Vatican II became a heart of theology of John Paul II during his pontificate, presented and expanded on many different occasions. One of those occasions was famous 1980 speech to UNESCO in Paris where he outlined the most important truth about culture and its relation to religion and the church. He said, culture is the proper way of existing and being for man. Man, who in the visible world is the only ontic subject of culture, is also its only proper object and its term. Culture is that through which man as man becomes more man, is more, the end of quotation. In John Paul II's understanding of culture, one finds a modern reinterpretation of traditional Catholic anthropology of ethics. In this basic understanding of culture, one finds the echo of the old Aristotelian Thomistic distinction of two kinds of human perfection and fulfillment, simpliciter and secundum quid. The second one, on which most of the modern culture is concentrated, refers to secondary perfections of the human person, being better as a scientist, artist, sportsman, musician, but it is in the first perfection of the human person that we should be mostly, that we should be, that we should be concerned with. It refers to being better simpliciter, being better as the human person, being better in being human, in being a person. This forms the essence of the true culture. Without that, any culture would be impoverished. It becomes a mass culture of medio mediocrity that ultimately demoralizes and destroys, reduces the human person. It seems that the emphasis on the ethical as the essence of culture forms the real contribution of John Paul II to the modern Catholic understanding of culture. The second John Paul II contribution to our understanding of culture consists in stressing its implicit religious character. I have said 
about this, a little bit about this. The Pope has said in Paris, to create culture, it is necessary to see man as a particular and sui iuris value, as the subject bound with personal transcendence. Only the person aware of his or her personal transcendence can really create culture. Now, can we think seriously about human transcendence outside of religious context? Possibly yes, but mostly in a very impoverished uh, form. For John Paul II, any culture should be seen as implicite or explicite religious, since it is always created by homo religiosus, who either asks the question about God or for some reason avoids it. There are two points worth noting in regard to this religious hermeneutics of culture. First, this interpretation of culture should not, should not be seen as a sign of recurring Christian or Catholic cultural imperialism, attempting to stamp everything as belonging somehow to the church. It's actually the opposite. Such interpretation of culture allows to see it in its origi originality and alterity, since it is grounded on the fundamental reverence for the creator of the culture, of the artist and of the person on the imago dei that refers to the creator. At the same time, this open attitude toward every artistic and cultural creation does not imply giving up the standards of truth in judging the particular culture, work of art, work of culture, especially in our times when transcendence becomes simply transgression. It seems that the important difference between transcendence and transgression is marked exactly by the moral factor. Human transcendence exists only in the shadow of the most important human question, how to be more human, how to be a better person, how to be. It's an ethical aspect. Human transgression concentrates exactly on avoiding this question, as if crossing the boundaries and moral norms would automatically lead to the fulfillment of the person, especially in art. We know well that from our experience that it does not. Thinking about today's impoverished culture, John Paul II pointed, pointed in Paris to the real anthropological crisis of the Western world. These societies are confronted with men specific crises, which consists of a growing laugh, lack of confidence with regard to his own humanity, to the sense of being a man, and to the affirmation and joy derived from it, which are creative. In all that, there is indirectly expressed a great systematic renunciation of the healthy ambition of being a man. Let us be under no illusion. The system that is constructed on the basis of these false imperatives, these fundamental renunciations will not create the future for man and for the culture. Before an attempt to describe the achievement of the pontificate of Benedict XVI, I would like to turn your attention uh, to one critical voice uh, on Second Vatican Council. The voice belongs to Australian theologian, member to, of the International Theological Commission, Professor Tracy Rowland. It was expressed in her important book from 20 years ago, Culture and the Thomistic Tradition, after Vatican II. Roland reflects on the detrimental and demoralizing role played by the Western culture in the moral and religious formation of the person. This is her argument in criticism of the positive treatment of modern culture in Vatican II. She writes, there presently exists a dramatic disjunction 
between the apparently positive treatment of modern culture in Gaudium et Spes and contemporary critiques of modern culture or select aspects thereof as culture of death, John Paul II, a polity of death, Catherine Pickstock, a culture with the form of a machine which is resistant to grace, David Schindler, and a culture which is toxic to the flourishing of virtue and the precepts of the natural law, Alistair McIntyre, the end of quotation. The moral, cultural, and religious growth of the person requires a specific moral environment which today is not supplied by the mass culture, Roland writes. The mass culture now present in, uh, mostly in its internet form is mostly a demoralizing factor, becomes a demoralizing factor, not supporting the growth of the human person. For church, this is a important question mark toward the celebrated Vatican II notion of inculturation. Inculturation has been often understood as in Christian faith, can incarnate in every culture in order to transform it from inside. It is possible as long as we understand the faith, not in the, as in the classical Protestant tradition, sola fides, but, in the, but as in the Catholic tra tradition, where faith comes on always with a specific ecclesial culture wh which guarantees its growth. This culture of faith was traditionally expressed as liturgia, martyria, e diaconia, liturgy, witness, and service, caritas, toward others. This is a set of cultural practices that make a believer, that guarantee a growth of faith, that distinguish a believer from a non-believer. Inculturation, therefore, should be seen as an encounter of cultures that starts with uh, taking care of Christian culture, of Catholic culture, culture that guarantees the growth of faith. As much as our world undergoes a secularization, I think this truth is more and more uh, important. It seems that this is the moment when we can point out to the most intellectual contribution of Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI. It consists exactly in his reflection on Catholic liturgy, music, and beauty, apart, of course, from his theological achievements. In the first exhortation of Benedict XVI, Sacramentum Caritatis, the Pope states that everything related to Eucharist should be marked by beauty. Beauty, for Benedict XVI, is not a subjective value, subjective individual experience, but experiential aspect of ontolog ontological truth of what really is. Pope Benedict calls the whole of Christian liturgy Veritatis splendor, the splendor of truth or the beauty of truth. He uses here the title of this most intellectually advanced encyclical of John Paul II. He writes, God allows himself to be first glimpsed in creation, in the beauty and harmony of the cosmos, but it is in Christ that we contemplate beauty and splendor at their source. Encounter with beauty has a pedagogical role for the Christian participating in the liturgy. Therefore, for Benedict XVI, so important is a topic of a proper music in liturgy. It's not only about the quality of music. 
It's ab about criteria for the church music that can point out not just to the human achievement and can celebrate not just the human greatness, but can point to God, as he says, it has to include a certain spiritualization of matter. So in his writings, we find a significant part, a significant reflection on the criteria of proper culture necessary for the spiritual formation of the faithful, pop and popular music of Dionysian character, ethnic music have to be excluded from the liturgy unless it is uh, transformed. It seems that um, it was Benedict XVI who was uh, very much aware of the culture of faith, culture that is necessary for the growth of faith and for the formation of the believer through the liturgy and through the whole uh, environment of um, intellectual, moral, and ethical environment. Um, I am far from exhausting the subject, but I may, I may be close to exhausting the listeners. Uh, as you know, uh, there can be no clear conclusions at the end of this uh, lecture, uh, besides some uh, general observations and questions. Now at the beginning of the 21st century, we seem to be much closer in our consciousness about culture to the beginning of the 20th century than to the time of Vatican II. The Christ Church seems to be unwelcomed or barely tolerated in many parts of the world. Certainly after all the stories about the end of history, we returned now to the dramatic reading of the human history, the history as the conflict, history as a tension, history as a drama. The book of Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible is back. Paradoxically, the modern physics with the anthropic principle regained the religious and myst mystical picture of the cosmos, far from the deterministic physics of the 19th century. However, there are now the modern uh, neurosciences with the project of artificial intelligence and the enhancement of the human being that create challenges for the Imago Dei character of the human person. They will ultimately question the Christian understanding of the human person, of human freedom and conscience and human transcendence. But this is already the topic probably for the next lecture. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you for your attention and patience. Father Professor Kupchak, thank you very much for your lovely lecture. We are all in the culture. We were born in the culture. We are living in the culture. So I think we have a lot of questions. So please. Use the mic. Dear Professor, dear Father, am I reading right that one of the challenges we'll be facing or the new um, or our children uh, would be how we should explain being Christians, how we should be able, in which way we can differentiate and show the, the real difference uh, of tran transcendent mind vis-a-vis -vis AI. How we can, what tool we can, we'll be using, how we can explain that, that that's one of the conflicts 
civilization as I see it. Please. Honestly, I, I don't think I am a competent person uh, to answer uh, to answer this uh, this question. Let me let me just uh, point out to a certain utopian vision of uh, artificial intelligence and the whole project of enhancement of the human uh, being. There are many uh, there are many utopian presuppositions in the whole uh, in the whole project of artificial intelligence. The first um, uh, pr uh, utopian presupposition is that one can um, really reduce the whole consciousness of the human person and all the mental operation, generally speaking, of the human person to mathematics. This is a very, uh, this is a very bold uh, uh, expectation uh, and uh, certainly from the point of view of the Christian uh, anthropology, very questionable. Um, secondly, uh, artificial intelligence um, is really a utopian vision of the person without a body. Many commentators point out that uh, uh, very often this post-human vision of the of the new, uh, you know, of the, of this creation of the new human being, it's always without a body, without a body. And if we say without a body, we have in the background um, the whole uh, idea of uh, body as essential for human being. Body as essential for everything that is human, including the cognition of God. There is no cognition of God. Uh, there is no truth outside of the human body, right? So we are at the, uh, uh, at the, at, uh, through, uh, outside of the human senses and outside of the sensual cognition. So we are really at the, at, at the very utop utopian uh, project of creating a different species, perhaps, perhaps intelligent, but certainly not, uh, uh, not uh, human and not transcendent in the way we use transcendence um, as referring to the human person. Transcendence referring to the human person, starting with the ancient tradition and Angelicum, uni uh, this university is a good place to say it, of course was um, uh, transcendence in the ancient tradition was always starting with the sensual cognition of the universe, of the cosmos. So from this point of view, the best manual on natural theology are the Psalms, right? From the Hebrew Bible, the Psalms, in which the psalmist simply looks at the beauty of the universe and he praises the creator of the universe because he sees uh, with his eyes, uh, let's using the modern language in a very pragmatic terms as body, between the bodies. He sees the beauty, he sees the order, and for this very reason he can reflect on the, on the divine as somehow present in the creation. So creation as the word of God. Now, where is it really mathematics? Is it really, can it be really expressed by artificial intelligence just as a mathematic operation? Thank you. I have a set of three questions. Uh, so, so feel free to answer any or all of them. Uh, the first, it, it seemed to me that uh, what Pope Saint Paul, John Paul II was trying to do is recapture the field of culture through, the, through a, a, 
with his, with his own definition of culture. A strategy that perhaps, and this sounds terrible as I'm going to say it, a strategy that seems to have perhaps failed because secular humanism was and continues to be in its current forms much stronger than the church in contemporary culture. So in, in one line, the question would be, do we believe that this strategy failed and we need to move to more secure ground? Question number one. Question number two. I was wondering if you could comment uh, something on the cult on, on culture in the pontificate of Pope Francis. Third, you ended, I thought brilliantly, on the, on the theme of liturgy, which to me seems to be that solid ground on which we can, we can begin the reclamation of culture. And it is precisely this field of liturgy which is the scene of pitched battles among Catholics today. So I was wondering if you could maybe also comment on that. Thank you very much. And apologies for the three questions. Yeah, th these, are, these are very serious questions, and thank you very much. Uh, every one of them poses, um, really creates a, a subject for another lecture, uh, which I can't do it uh, to you. Um, um, in a sense, the easiest answer is to uh, the easiest answer theoretically is to question number three. Um, the uh, struggle, the post-conciliar struggle of a liturgy, is far from over. Is far from over, right? We are in the middle of it. Uh, what happened after the Second Vatican Council, as we know, in many countries has been really a devastation of liturgy. Uh, liturgy be became, as Benedict XVI very often uh, pointed out, became a parody to what it should be uh, with uh, um, pagan music and vernacular music. Um, um, crisis in uh, preaching. That's one of the points uh, that Pope Francis uh, um, uh, uh, takes. So the present, um, the present return to the traditional liturgy and to the liturgy of uh, Pius V, uh, in my opinion, can certainly be seen, especially among the young generation who doesn't remember the times before the Second Vatican Council, but it's a revolt against what they have in the churches. And it's certainly a desire to have a more serious liturgy, a liturgy that it's really a divine service, that points out to God, that uh, includes a serious church music uh, with, and all the necessary elements of the uh, liturgy. But we are in the middle uh, of this quarrel. It's far from over, right? It depends on the country in which we uh, live. In some of the countries where the so-called reforms of Vatican II were accepted quite often with haste, and this revolutionary zeal, uh, the destruction was more serious. In countries, in country from where I come, in Poland, there was no revolutionary zeal because the Berlin Wall pre prevented it from happening, right? So all the changes, good and bad, were happening slower. This one, for, uh, for good, it depends what country, but uh, the, uh, the process is far from, uh, from over. I think the gift of Benedict XVI pontificate provided us with very serious principles of what Catholic liturgy should look like, right? Um, and everything that he, that, he, that he pointed out, a real church music, Latin language, which has been with the Catholic liturgy for 2,000 years, Gregorian chant, this is not going to go away, right? It has to reappear in uh, Catholic liturgy, right, point. Um, your first question, um, 
I will skip the second question. However, uh, the, the first question uh, uh, is also a very serious one, and thank you for asking it. Um, as I said, uh, the church now, um, 60 years after Vatican II, well, we are right here in Rome, 60 years from time when the proceedings of Vatican II are actually taking place here in the Eternal City, uh, the church has much more a dramatic vision of the human history. That's for sure. That's why I said that we are, in a sense, closer to the consciousness of the early 20th century than to the time of Vatican II in seeing the, the history. However, the history of the church also taught us that uh, tragic events of the, in the human history that we cannot sometimes prevent uh, for example, the uh, Marxist revolution and the communist revolution uh, in the uh, late 19th century, uh, properly read, uh, put the church on the proper track. So careful reading of the human history makes us understand that the church has to pick up certain topics and certain subjects, be present in certain groups of people, be present with a certain uh, message which the church was not aware of it in the past. And of course the, um, the workers question in the end of the 19th century that was raised because of the uh, Marxist challenge and communist challenge is good example of it, the beginning of the Catholic social uh, thought, neglected in a sense uh, in, the modern, uh, in the modern times. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was talking about culture and the church and we see um, a decline in people going to church, and we see the church culture kind of, you know, do you think that that is a, I feel like in America especially, that there's a lack of culture generally to art, beauty, music, and you know, you used to walk into a church and there would be this beautiful music and there'd be paintings and be architecture, and the culture now is turned away from the church. Do you think that that decline in the church culture has affected the, you know, disassociation with just culture in general. Well, that's a topic for a lecture. <laughs> uh, well, this question should be uh, really directed to the president of St. Nicholas Foundation and to people who support him, because this is uh, one of the main aims uh, of um, St. Nicholas Foundation in establishing this lecture series and establishing a whole series of programs in Poland to renew the uh, dialogue between church and culture in general and art in particular, uh, and painters even more uh, particularly. Uh, there was no uh, question, and I said, uh, Dr. Karłowicz would be an uh, 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 excellent uh, person to talk uh, uh, about it. Uh, there has been a break uh, in the um, uh, conversation between uh, church and art. We can argue uh, about the history of this break and the um, uh, and the story of this break. We can argue when, at, w at which moment, the, as, you, as you have said, the art in our churches became banal, right? And the only thing uh, we, can, uh, we can, we can have the religious music of Baroque period uh, played in our churches, but we are far from uh, creating our church music and our church art now. We had many conversations with uh, Dr. Karłowicz about purely um, mm, 
odtwórcza rola, rola odtwórcza, jakbyś to powiedział. Rep repetitive, thank you. Uh, about purely repetitive uh, character of uh, church uh, art nowadays. This repetitive character, and I, I would like to be well understood, for example, consists in our, um, uh, we talked about it uh, many times, in our, um, um, in our imitating of the uh, Eastern icons in the Catholic Church, right? That in a sense, it, 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 it looks like the only uh, paintings we have now are the icons, right? But we had a great tradition in the church of uh, realistic paintings pretty much in every... St. Thomas uh, spoke about uh, being a better person, simpliciter, that is uh, uh, perfection of the individual. And then the, uh, in contrast with saying a better painter or a better uh, citizen or something, maybe I'm not identifying you there, but my question is this, uh, or, or a comment before the question. It seems, Father, that, that in the last, I don't know, number of years, that there's been a, a lack of emphasis or lack of, of, of recognizing the importance of the perfection of the individual as an individual that is practicing the virtues and, and being a better a person as an individual and all the emphasis is on being a better uh, or even not even on the individual at all it's like uh, uh, on the environment or, or, or on society or, or remedying this social issue or this so it's all like outward out bettering this uh, solu uh, finding solutions for, for this stuff this exterior to the individual but the individual is like forgotten the, the uh, perfection and the bettering of the individual why has that happened, and do you think there's anything we can do about it? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I am convinced, as I, as I try to say, that stressing the ethical character of culture was one of the uh, most important achievements of Karol Wojtyła and John Paul II. Of course, he worked for his whole life in ethics, and anthropology. So it was very easy for him to understand that uh, if culture is to build the human person, uh, it has to be at its, at its core ethical in character. So it has to support the growth of the human person. Um, yeah. This, this, is, this is extremely important. I, I often uh, joke that if I would be the uh, Minister of Education of Poland, I would uh, introduce the impossible, which is uh, one month uh, necessary service of all the young people as volunteers in the local hospitals, right? This is what the school should be about. It's not only about learning music and learning mathematics. It's about becoming a person. Where, where, where do you become a person if not uh, uh, encountering human need and human, human suffering? We don't have to look for it. You just, you just volunteer in the local foster care place. You work with elderly and this should be obligatory. Right? In the past, in a sense, we can think about the ancient societies where it was built in the normal fabric of everyday life. Now, with a certain uh, uh, professionalization of medical care, with a certain transformation of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of, of, our uh, of our families and of our, of our, of our life, it, it's, it's absent from the formation of the human uh, persons but it's not formation anymore then. It's just education. Uh, thank you for your, uh, for your speech. Um, for me, as a young person, the Second Vatican Council was already a long time ago. That was the time of my, my grandparents. Um, and I will use the example of my grandparents. So, uh, on the one side, my grandparents were quite intellectual and therefore were quite familiar with classical literature, for example. Their lives were steeped in uh, classical music, uh, uh, both 
really classical and contemporary, both uh, art, uh, painting, and all these different things, like steeped in, in higher art. And even my other grandparents, who were simple workers, they listened to classical music every day. And, but now, when, you, when I look at my own generation, you see that there's this clear break between, uh, in the culture, um, that this tr uh, cultural tradition in music, in painting, in philosophy is, there is no awareness of it now. So now the church finds itself in a weird way um, trying to juggle both balls. On the one hand, trying to engage the culture, but on the other hand, trying to save the culture that, uh, that was built up in the 19th and 20th centuries. So how do you see, uh, how does this affect the interaction that needs to happen between uh, culture and the church? Thank you, thank you. This is, this is a great, uh, a very ambitious uh, uh, question, which of course I cannot understand, uh, I cannot answer, but let me just give you a, give a couple of my uh, thoughts on that. This uh, question refers uh, to your question about the certain events in our modern history and a certain, um, um, uh, let's put it clearly, uh, inability of the church or lack of knowledge of the church, how to respond to it. Uh, honestly speaking, we have never had, uh, as to my knowledge, the, uh, such a situation, the, the church and we as, a, as, a, as a human beings, as a society, are, and as Catholics, we are confronted with unprecedented events in the human history. There has never been a mass culture that, that is transmitted uh, outside of the family structure, outside of the local society culture, uh, independent of any control, directly to the, to, the, to the addressee, right? Through Netflix, uh, through music that somebody is producing somewhere, and our young people, our children listen to it, watch, on their screens, are educated totally outside of the, let's say, local control, control of the family, control of the parents. Um, the church uh, is uh, faced with this uh, phenomenon um, uh, and has to, has to create a response. However, we do not have uh, the Vatican II, uh, this was the first event in the history of the church where actually we find in the church document a mentioning of mass culture. Uh, it seems that in 1960s, where Vatican II was taking place, we were not yet so clearly aware of the demoralizing character of mass culture, right? So in a sense, in the documents of Vatican II, we have a positive view of uh, 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 mass culture. Well, if we have the TV, if we have the radio, we can be better educated. We can say now, if we have the smartphones, we can learn the foreign languages. We can, uh, we can uh, consult Google on every issue. We have the whole world of knowledge just in our pocket. But, of course, we know that most of the people do not use the smartphones for that, right? To enhance their knowledge and to have this access to, not to listen to Chopin, right? We can listen to Chopin. We have the whole music of Chopin in our pockets, but this is not exactly what we are using it for. That's a totally new situation, potentially uh, demoralizing, uh, dangerous, but as always, as I try to say, in those dangerous events of the human history, we have to look for the possibilities of, um, for the chances for the church, right? And of course, we know that the, the world of internet provides many examples of evangelization, of getting to the people with the, with the gospel, to the people that otherwise perhaps we would be not able to, uh, to reach. So it's always a drama. It's always a drama. Okay. 
let us use some controversial language now. <laughs> uh, what I mean is, um, as we know, the Second Vatican Council is uh, mostly a pastoral experience, right? Not a dogmatic uh, experience. Uh, one of the main topics is, of course, dialogue with the culture. Uh, what I'm interested in, how would you comment, Father, uh, about um, the situation in which we are right now in, um, in this exact dialogue? Uh, because we have been confronted with uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, ideologies, discourses, I don't know how to say that, discourses. Uh, that are based upon a, a certain language, uh, a certain vision of reality. You could say uh, a neo-Marxist version of reality where all of reality, all of society is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is certain groups that are fighting for power. And my question is power and uh, do you, first, first, first thing, do you think that uh, this agreement with modernism um, is connected to uh, the church's uh, uh, fall of authority over culture? I know it's, 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 it sounds a bit uh, dangerous to ask this question this way because uh, we are falling into this language of war. And so the other question is, how can we prevent ourselves from um, falling into this, uh, this uh, image of reality as ideological war? Uh, does the Second Vatican Council provide us with any tools for that? Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is, very, this is very important, I think, from, uh, from your circling over the core of the question, uh, really the most important uh, you were able to land in the last, uh, in the last part where you said, how, how does the church avoid falling into the uh, cultural war, into the, into the cultural camp, right, of the, of the modernity, where basically we are, we are all asked in our own countries to take sides right, um, to be on one side. And um, of course the church, uh, it has to be um, the, the brutal uh, political struggle of postmodern um, has made us uh, to abstract a little bit from the political dimension of the church. The church is inherently politic, political because it has the ambition of influencing the reality, uh, in but it does so not by political means. So the church is political, wants to transform the reality because we are a social body. That's first. Right? We are not just individuals that find a, this uh, nice environment here in the um, uh, a generous university here and we can talk openly about, quite openly, about issues. Um, uh, but we want to transform the reality. We want to transform the reality because people are suffering and uh, there is a cruelty immense cruelty in the public life and in our reality with wars and with all kinds of injustices. We, 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 are, we, 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 we don't agree on that, right? We want to transform it and that's political. But, uh, second, uh, but second element is, so we have a stance, we have a clear stand on certain issues in contemporary church dialogue we have um, Confusion. We have confusion about the priorities. Uh, confusion happens with where a certain secondary issues became uh, number one, became a pro priority issues. Certainly it happens nowadays with the ecological issue, right? 
where ecology becomes a number one, the only one moral absolute. No, ecology is an important factor in designing the reality and living a human life. But there are very, pressive, very, very, very pressing issues because people are dying of hunger in the world. Uh, there are wars to, to being fought in the world. People are dying as we speak uh, uh, in bloody battles. So uh, a moral, sound moral theology, and of course there is a protection of the unborn. So a clear moral theology has to provide a clear uh, understanding of priorities, uh, uh, which very often in the modern confusion disappear. And the last moment, sa having said all that, the church, the Catholic church, is a universal church, right? So we are, as I pointed out in this whole uh, discourse on culture, this is the difference between a sect and Catholic Church, that we are concerned about transformation of the whole world and salvation of the whole world because Christ is the savior of all, also Muslims, also Buddhists, also Russians, also Ukrainians, and so on of everybody, right? So in this present culture camp, we are being cornered into taking, uh, into taking sides, which the uh, universal church never can do. So it has to have a stand on a specific issues, very clear, but at the same time, it, it has to be political in nature, but not being cornered into, into being one or the other uh, political party. That's extremely difficult. Uh, yeah. Because we are temporarily material beings, there will be last question by Darius Karbovic. Would you like to try to answer a question? Because we have a very good founding in the Vatican Second teaching, very strong one, I think, that uh, the position that uh, creating Christian culture, it's a kind of a collaboration in the work of incarnation of Logos, is one of the strong, strongest, uh, say, uh, theological concept which, uh, which help us to understand and, and create a kind of a normative point of view on, on the attitude to uh, culture. But at the same time, I think never we faced a stronger crisis of a Christian culture as after that fact. I may say, coming here, we have a 25th, 25th anniversary of letter to artists. And uh, I may say, quite frankly, that artists received no other letters after that time. Uh, I mean, our everyday experience that we are living in the dark age of Christian culture, dark age of Christian culture, and church focus on being NGOs or defender of ecology, pay no attention to the problem of culture. I mean, we are living in the age very similar to the age in which um, Alexandrian Jews were living before translating Septuaginta into Greek. I mean, very quickly, there will be almost no one understanding Hebrew, I mean, our Hebrew, if we not pay strong attention to that, say, challenge. What, what happened that having so good documents, so good teaching, we have first not even art, but even no criteria. Uh, you, you, you mentioned Ratzinger, who says quite obvious thing that it's not a only a quality which differs Christian art from non-Christian art. But uh, if I'm not wrong, he didn't say discover a criteria which may help us to understand why spectacular blasphemous 
piece of art may be now defended as a purely Christian, for example, and there is no answer in terms of criteria and no institutional answer also. So, I mean, what, what happened? Well, of course, I can't answer uh, this. Uh, uh, this uh, you ask me the question. Uh, all the questions were the questions I cannot answer. Uh, but that's uh, that's uh, the lack of competence of the of the speaker. However, uh, Darius, I I would like to. There are many people here who certainly uh, uh, would be uh, able to engage you on the subject. I would like to just again point out one line of uh, thinking. I mean, how can we expect uh, the creation of art? Uh, of Christian art or Catholic art in the culture that it become the, that becomes irreligious, right? I mean, in Rome, um, we had uh, Caravaggio, who created wonderful uh, Christian pictures, right, who are in the churches now uh, with all the complicated personality so far from Catholic moral norms that he was. But being in the, being in the, uh, in the Catholic city, being in the Catholic culture, he was able to create, uh, he lived with those ideas. Now what happens if you live in the civilization that, it be, that becomes not only anti-Christian, but it, be, uh, it becomes irreligious, right? How can you expect uh, the creation of Christian art? Of course, so this is, this is the first line of thought. The second line of thought is, um, uh, see, we, when we speak, uh, I, I think in the background of your uh, question is, of course, Europe or more generally Western civilization. But see, when we look seriously at Vatican II, Vatican II was also a reorientation of the church for the first time, uh, saying that the centers of gravity of the church are moving to different places in the world, right? And we have, we have here brothers from Nigeria and uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, right, Viet, uh, Viet, Vietnam, and I would, you know, I would like to uh, uh, direct this question to them. You know, what about Christian art in those countries that have been uh, evangelized 100 or, you know, 200 years ago? Uh, how uh, the gospel transformed a local tradition to create art, art there? I remember from my um, uh, visits in Japan that where, where I saw uh, very moving uh, pictures of uh, Our Lady and Jesus with, with, with different Christian iconography, but set in the uh, Japanese samurai culture, where Jesus was, was basically dressed as a, as a samurai, right? Um, so, uh, well, you know, uh, in different cultures, we have different means of expressing the same uh, truth. So, my, uh, 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 my kind of re line of reasoning would be, we, we would have to ask people from different continents, how is the state of Christian art over there, but that we have the problem uh, with Catholic art on the continent, that it's losing its faith, well, there is no wonder for me, right? Pavel Kupchak, thank you once again. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of you here in Angelicum and in front of your screens. The next public lecture within the GP2 lecture series will be given on Wednesday, November 8th by Professor Jean-Luc Marion. The lecture will be entitled Going Around Metaphysics. It will be heard here at Angelicum. We cordially invite you all to join us on that day.
Thank you very much.